Association of Nephrology and Can Solve CKD, where she leads several knowledge translation programs and activities. Um, so thank you, Selena. We're looking forward to learning from you this morning. Thank you, Jennifer, um, and uh, good afternoon, um, everyone. It's uh, such a pleasure to be with all of you today. And um, this is such a fantastic opportunity for me to speak to you about something I'm so passionate about. So what I'm gonna do is just um, share my, my screen. Okay. Okay. Can um, can everyone see the slides? Okay. Thank you for the thumbs up, Jennifer. All right. So um, I'd just like to begin uh, by acknowledging that I'm residing on the traditional lands of the Blackfoot and the people of Treaty Seven in southern Alberta. Um, the city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta Region Three. So before I start, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Dawn and Megan and Jennifer for this uh, wonderful opportunity. As I mentioned earlier, this is a topic I'm very passionate about. A large part of the work that I do as a knowledge translation broker is to translate research findings, essentially to make sure that they're not only are they accessible, but that the right information gets into the hands of the people that can use that knowledge for impactful change. So my presentation today is really going to be around how you can communicate your science in a much more effective and engaging way using storytelling techniques. <clears throat> so my goal for today is to show you how to turn your science presentation into a good science story. I'll start by telling you why stories are important and why you should use them, and then go into a little bit of a discussion why we find it hard to tell good science stories. And then we'll come to the really interesting part. Uh, we will spend most of the workshop today, and this is where I'm going to show you how you can use some classic scientific uh, storytelling techniques to develop your own personal science stories and to make your presentations more um, engaging. Um, if you're comfortable, I'd encourage you to keep your cameras on. It's always nice to see your faces and your reactions. Um, I usually like my style of presentation to be a lot more interactive. So feel free to raise your hand if you want to chime in or you have a question that you have. Um, you can type in your questions or your comments. Um, Dawn is going to help moderate that piece for me as well. And uh, I'll be pausing frequently throughout the presentation just to see if anyone has any questions and then we'll have lots of time at the end of today's presentation. Sarah Al-Shafi is a science communicator and I've been following her for a few years and attended um, one of her workshops on how to create science, effective science stories. I think this quote by her pretty much summarizes the rationale for this workshop. Science is a search for evidence, but science communication is a search for meaning. I think what storytelling does is it makes your science meaningful. It gives your research meaning. Allow me to begin my presentation with a story. It was the year 2000. I had recently completed three months of intensive field work in one of the largest slum communities in Nairobi, Kenya. You see, I was pursuing a lifelong passion of mine as a qualitative researcher. Um, and I was trying to understand how marginalized women were accessing primary health care and how they were, what their coping strategies were. Selena, um, we aren't seeing your slides. Oh, you're not on presenter mode. Hang on one or second. Or perhaps you're sharing the wrong screen, I'm not sure. Let me, thank you for that. Give me one second, let's try this again. There we go. Is that better? Yeah, it looks good. Excellent, thank you for that. Okay, so um, I'll just pick up from where uh, my story starts in Nairobi, Kenya. So we all know that economic development does not benefit men and women equally. 
Even today, women are disproportionately represented amongst the poor. In many developing countries like Kenya, overpopulation, overcrowding, and corruption has outstripped the capacity of the local authorities to provide even basic services. And this has led to poor outcomes, um, especially health outcomes. So this was a topic that I was always curious about, but I digress. As part of my degree program, all graduate students were required to present their research to the Department of Geography before defending our thesis. And this was a really big deal. We dedicated two days where the entire department came together and all students, masters and PhD students would present their research. How was I going to explain my qualitative research to an audience that was primarily made up of physical geographers? These were people who were interested in quantitative research, you know, um, interested in topics like GIS, remote sensing, physical geography, right? I would be talking about a place that no one had really been to, somewhere far, far away, where the experiential knowledge of women I was interviewing would frame an understanding of how the human landscape impacts health outcomes. I was starting to get a feeling of dread. I decided to focus on three presentation techniques to help me address my fears. And I did this with the help of my supervisor. I had to make sure that my presentation answered these three questions. The first question was, how would my, what does my audience respond to? And this I thought was fairly simple. I knew the, uh, the members in my audience and most of the folks in the Department of uh, Geography and I knew they really liked numbers. So I used graphs and tables in my presentation, but I supplemented those, uh, that data with quotes from the women that I interviewed, some pictures, um, and I used other uh, presentation techniques to get them to feel like they were part of my story. I really wanted them to connect emotionally with my research. The second question was, how was I going to make them see themselves in my story? So most researchers really are seeking to answer questions that they are passionate about. I put this in my presentation. And then I spoke about challenges of field work, right? Lots of researchers that are out there, regardless of what research you're doing, do have some challenges and stories about field work. So I talked about issues around accessibility to the slum community. I talked about language and cultural barriers, issues of safety and trust, and how I had to adapt to last minute changes. The third question that I tried to answer was, how will I make them care about my work? And this was something that I thought was going to be a lot harder to do. I needed to com convey to my audience the impact of the work that I was doing beyond, beyond this one community in Kenya. But I also needed, needed them to appreciate or at least see the significance of this kind of research that I would be doing. <clears throat> this is perhaps the most impactful slide that I used in my presentation. Given this is not exactly how I presented it, I pared it down uh, quite a bit. But what this table does is it speaks to the different strategies that the communities themselves identified that would help in improving their access to health and their well being and coping strategies. What really surprised me is that this slide of all the information that I presented in that presentation is the one thing that my audience was most, most interested about. It generated the most questions at the end of my presentation. I thought it was, it was heartwarming that they really wanted to know about the community where I'd been doing my research and how these strategies could be turned into policy recommendations. So all in all, I think they got to see the importance of my research. Against what felt like all odds, I won second prize for the best presentation that year. All right, so what we're going to do is just quickly pause. And what I want to find out from you are, is just to reflect on this one question. I'm willing to bet that everyone here has attended a talk where it was not clear why the study is relevant or how it might impact people's lives. So you can unmute your microphones or you can type in your responses in the chat. But I, the question that I would like you to answer is what makes a presentation ineffective? 
Like, what are the ingredients that make a presentation less effective? Jargon, yes. I don't know if I'm supposed to raise my hand, but um, like if there's a lot of text on the slide or if they're reading off the slide. Yep, so text heavy slides or just reading, correct? So you're not connecting with your audience. Too much data, missing the big picture, yes. Anything else? If Yes, you are presenting information that may not be relevant to others. Uh, no personal connection, zipping through a lot of slides in a short time. Slides and talking points don't match. Yes, actually that I have uh, seen. Okay, so this was great. Thank you all for participating. I think the bottom line here and the point that I'd like to get across is that we should not assume that good science will speak for itself. People will only understand your research if it is made meaningful to them. <clears throat> People love stories. We read, watch, tell, and listen to stories every day. There's no doubt that the best presenters and the best speakers are all excellent storytellers. Despite this, most researchers do not think in terms of story when they're asked to tell us about their work. And I'm sure many of you are wondering, can you really turn your science into a good story? One of the most effective ways to do this is through storytelling and an ability to utilize some storytelling techniques, even when you're talking about science. But why are stories so powerful? To answer this question, we have to go back about 100,000 years ago when humans first started to speak. For roughly 94,000 years, we could only use a spoken word to communicate. As long as they've been campfires, people have gathered around them to derive meaning from experience and to pass along that knowledge and wisdom. So stories have helped us survive and our brains have evolved to really love them. We have become story listeners and the hearing and telling of, telling of stories brings us back to this very natural primal state of listening. Research also shows us that storytelling affects multiple regions of our brain. Our brains respond differently when receiving information as a story rather than as straight facts or data. Once hooked by our story, our brains release hormones that affect our mood and our social behavior. So you could say stories are a shortcut to our emotions. The brain of the listener mirrors the brain of the storyteller. In other words, when you hear a well-told story, your brain reacts as if you are experiencing it yourself. So clearly, storytelling has a neurological and a physiological effect on us. And the bottom line is we are hardwired to receive and give information through storytelling. A good story has huge advantages for you. It can put new information in a familiar context, which focuses both attention and elicits emotion. A good story can help your audience comprehend, recall, and care about the information that's being presented to them. And more importantly, as a communication tool, storytelling can help you engage with a much broader audience, making even the most complex scientific concepts accessible. It is a great way for you, it's a great way to connect people to the work that you do. Any questions, comments, thoughts? I'm just gonna take a look at the chat very quickly. Okay, some great ideas here. I All was right. going to say, I really like the imagery that you use, like the picture from the Croods and a couple of the other movies. I was like, oh, yeah, it totally does make sense. You need to have a story. I think it engages people and then they're interested and want to know what's going on. So I love the, the imagery that you're using. 
Thank you so much. Yeah, it's again, we'll, we'll talk about how the use of imagery can be a hook and can supplement your story. But again, it's just, it's one of those techniques that you just learn over years, or you learn to perfect it over years. So thank you for that. Okay, so this is a really important question and I'm curious to see, uh, hear your responses. Obviously a lot of people, especially scientists and academics have concerns about telling Telling, talking about their science or their research as a story. So reflecting on yourself and the work that you do, what are some of the concerns that you might have about telling your science story or your research story? You can um, type in your answers in the chat or you know, feel free to um, unmute your microphone. Hey, Selena, it's Danica here. Hi, Danica. Nice to see you. I'm really enjoying your presentation so far. Um, this kind of has the same thing. To, um, this like kind of has the same meaning as what Sophia said in the chat. Mm -hmm. So I feel like my research sometimes isn't as complicated or as difficult as other people. So people kind of won't take it seriously, or they won't think they're like they won't even consider it science, um, but rather like social science or something like that. So. I think that's something that kind of um, is something that I have to worry about, especially in the field that I'm working in. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Uh, I'm just going to go back and read a couple of these comments here. Okay, so being able to make complex or niche data accessible to audiences, agreed. How do you simplify the story for more, for more general audiences without losing the important details? Yeah. Concerned about oversimplification, maintaining objectivity. Um, so yeah, these are these are these are wonderful comments, and I think v valid concerns. I in most presentations that I do, these are the kind of concerns that I hear about. So over the course of the next hour or so, I'm going to do my best to try and answer some of these questions. I'm going to point you to some resources, and I have a good worksheet that I will share with you at the end, and uh, Megan will send that to you um, after the presentation. All right. Why is it hard to tell a good story? And in order to understand this, we need to go back a little bit. Researchers want to very accurately communicate scientific information. And the reason they do this is because they want to update existing understanding of the world and to shift those understand understandings, right? So knowledge, not just for the sake of knowledge. The concept of storytelling somehow feels counterintuitive to this. And as you all mentioned in the chat with your concerns, there are lots of good reasons or valid reasons why we find it hard to tell a good science story. On the other hand, you might have the most compelling evidence, but your audience is not ready to accept the evidence. This is because people tend to search for evidence that confirms their own pre-existing beliefs while ignoring or rejecting evidence that contradicts it. And this is called the confirmation bias. I'm sure most of you have heard of this concept. Uh, it, the best analogy or the best example I can think of are anti-vaxxers, right? These are not necessarily uneducated people, but what they do is they ignore the information because it does not conform to their beliefs and their values. People do not make deci decisions solely based on scientific evidence. We know this in, in medicine and healthcare. Again, your audience has their own personal beliefs and their own emotional understanding of the world. I would argue that by using storytelling techniques, it can help you build a connection with your audience and hopefully kind of meet them in that middle ground. Storytelling is something that does not come naturally to most people, especially because it requires an emotional and a creative element. Researchers are trained to be concise, to be precise and technical. So the language that you would use in a scientific presentation or the language of science isn't necessarily the same language that you would use to tell a story. But I ask you, isn't there and science really a discovery? Sorry, I just had to mute somebody. I hope you don't mind. 
<clears throat> so I want you to think about a couple of stories from biological sciences and chemistry, right? So how did the mammals evolve or trying to understand the demise of dinosaurs? These are all stories of discovery. Um, chemistry and physics have similar stories, right? Think about the story of the discovery of um, antibiotics. I think there are a lot of stories to tell and science ultimately is about discovery. And yet many scientists feel that telling their stories about their research feels like an unnatural way to explain what they do. So researchers have been trained to master this scientific formula when writing or talking about your science. And we're all familiar with this, right? It starts with uh, telling us about your hypothesis, then talking about your methods, how data was um, analyzed, and then highlighting the results and what this means. This formula and format is really about objectivity and it forces researchers, academics to be very brief and concise, but also to be able to speak a common language with fellow scientists. But that formula is a far cry from a story of inspiration, adventure or discovery. I really like this image because um, it kind of shows you a, you know, a, a generic structure of what a story looks like. And throughout history, this story structure is remarkably consistent. So most stories begin with, with the character um, having some dream or a desire to change something. And then they take a leap of faith. Um, they have to fight for something or overcome some obstacles to climb to the top where they can, they're ultimately successful. So can you see how structuring your science story, even following this structure loosely, can put your science in a familiar context? Another misconception that I often hear about when I do this presentation is that a lot of people are worried that storytelling implies changing the truth or kind of fudging numbers or the data. Telling your science story does not mean that you need to change the truth in the evidence, rather that it's, a, it's about finding a story that your evidence tells. The type of story that you will tell will depend on the value and the weight placed on different elements of the story. So let me elaborate. Let's think about your science story being framed as a cautionary tale, right? And these are the kind of science stories that usually provide a lesson learned. An example could be, you know, um, why taking the time to listen to a patient could have changed the course of a treatment, right? That's a good cautionary story. Purpose stories are usually big, big, big picture stories that convey some big idea. They can also be inspirational stories. And in these kind of stories, you hear researchers talking about how they overcome, they overcame a big challenge or what, how they got to a successful outcome. And then there are these uh, stories that offer uh, a change idea. And these are what if stories or imagine stories. These are the kind of stories that inspire you to dream big or to hope about, a, to have hope about a, a better future. There are lots of articles um, on this topic. And this is just one paper that I wanted to highlight. Uh, I'm not gonna go into the details of this. And if you have time, I would encourage you to read it. But the authors in this paper propose four simple steps to scientific storytelling. And they do this because they want to show researchers how they can remain true to the tenets of science and maintain the integrity of the evidence, but doing so in a way that is compelling. Any questions before I move on? I'm just going to quickly check the chat. Okay, perfect. 
So we're going to move on now to the classic storytelling techniques that I'd like to share with you, which you can use in your presentation. So as I go through this next section, think about the work you're doing. Even think about some of the presentations we heard today, because um, especially the TED style talks, a lot of the presenters used some of these techniques. So just try and reflect on this in your own context and what you might have heard. Remember that a good public speaker takes their audience on a journey, leaving them feeling inspired and motivated. But structuring your speech to get your ideas across and to keep your audience engaged throughout that story can be tricky. So we're going to look at a few uh, storytelling techniques. What I've done for this presentation is I've tried to refer to some examples from TED Talks, um, some YouTube uh, talks and resources that you can easily find online. So feel free to jot those down and then um, watch them in your own time. The first technique that I want to talk to you about is called the monomyth. It's also called the hero's journey. This structure of storytelling is familiar in almost all folk tales. And even the stories that you see produced today for mass audiences, like, in, like for, for movies, follow this structure. In this structure, it starts off with a hero leaving their home, and then they set out on a difficult journey. So they move from a place that is known to unknown. Along the way, they overcome, they're, they, they're faced with some trials or some challenges. They overcome these trials and then they return home a hero with a reward or a newfound wisdom that helps their communities or, help, or other people benefit from it. If you think of the story of the Lion King or Star Wars, these are great examples of the hero's journey. For, if you're a researcher and you want to use this technique, it's a great technique if you want to take your audience on a journey about your research, right? Like where you started and where you're going. It's a great technique to show the benefits of taking risk and also to demonstrate what you have learned. The story of Moana has all the elements that makes for a great hero's journey. So for those of you who haven't seen this, I, I recommend watching it. It's, just, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful animated uh, cartoon and a great story. But the story starts with Moana. Moana lives on an island. Her dad is a chief of the tribe and he believes that the island has everything that they could offer. However, life on the island does not feel authentic for Moana and she wants to explore the ocean instead. A problem arises. Her village is running out of food. Despite her father's disapproval, Moana leaves the island and embarks on a difficult adventure, encountering lots of challenges in her quest to explore the ocean. However, with the help of her friends, she eventually solves the problem and she returns to the island victorious, saving her people from starvation. Now, let's think about the hero's journey and using that structure, let's turn your science into a hero story. So I want you to think about yourself or your team as the main character. Your study background is the setting for the story. For example, maybe a new disease is becoming more prevalent. What is the problem you are trying to solve, right? And that's where you introduce the tension. What is known and or unknown about this disease? Are existing treatments not good enough? And then how are you going to solve it, right? These are the actions you're going to take. Maybe you need a clinical trial to test a new drug. We know that in science, we will be, we will overcome, we'll, we're, going to, we're going to be faced with a series of challenges. So tell us about those challenges. Maybe you weren't able to get funding on time. Perhaps it's poor patient recruitment or there are delays in obtaining the new drug. And then you're gonna tell us how you overcame those challenges, right? You present your methods, uh, maybe a new collaboration or new funding partners. So I hope you kind of get the gist of it, but you know, follow this story, you would then continue on and tell us about your findings. What did you find and the results? 
um, to be able to bring this all together, make sure you let your audience know, what are you going to do with this new knowledge, right? Or how has this research process enriched you as a person? If told effectively, this could be a very captivating story and it can leave your audience wanting more. The second technique that I want to talk to you about is called in medias res. It's a Latin phrase that means in the midst of things. So in the image you see on the slide, you can see a person being dropped right in the middle of a timeline. To use this technique, you'll need to start your story in the heat of the action before explaining how you got there. So think about a movie you watched where the main character is running for their life or being chased and you were wondering like, how did he get there? So by dropping your audience into the most exciting part of your story, they're going to be gripped from the very beginning and, want, and they're going to stay engaged because they want to find out what happens. It's a wonderful technique that works for shorter presentations. Zach Ibrahim's TED Talk is a great example of this technique. He begins his talk with the revelation that his father helped plan the 1993 World Trade uh, bombings. His audience is gripped from the beginning. Then he goes to recount events in his childhood and how he chooses a path different for himself. His story is ultimately shocking, powerful, and inspiring. The other technique that you can use is called converging ideas. And it's a technique where different ideas come together to form one story or one product. These are the types of stories that are used to explain how a single idea was the culmination of several great minds working together towards one goal. The story of COVID-19 is a perfect example of this technique. And it tells you how the world came together due to, to fight the pandemic. Never before have so many experts in so many countries simultaneously focused on a topic with such urgency. One of the scientists that was, that was interviewed in this article said that the ability to work collaboratively setting aside personal academic problem uh, uh, progress was occurring right now because it was a matter of survival. The false start is another storytelling technique that you can use when you're talking about your science. So you begin to tell a seemingly predictable story before you disrupt it. So you lure your audience into a false sense of security and then shock them by turning the tables. It's an ideal technique to use uh, when talking about things you have learned as you were doing your research, for example, or an innovative way that you solved a problem. Best of all, it's a really quick attention hack where you disrupt your audience's expectations and surprise them into paying closer attention to what you're talking about. J.K. Rowling's um, uh, commencement speech at Harvard University is a really good example um, of this technique. She begins her speech in a typical fashion. She talks about her time at college and the expectations of her parents. The audience is expecting her now to start talking about the growing success of her writing career. Instead, she focuses on a time in her 20s where she felt she failed at so many things in her life. And then what follows, of course, as a story of inspiration. The petal structure um, is another storytelling technique that is used to organize several stories that all relate back to a single message. So think of the petals as overlapping as one story introduces the next. If you use this technique, you're basically learning to weave a rich tapestry of your evidence to support a central th theory or to support your conclusions. By showing your audience how all these stories are related, you leave them with the feeling, with, you leave them feeling the true importance and the weight of your message. A really good example of the petal structure is this uh, 
TED Talk by Dan Butner on how to live to be 100 plus. I've watched this presentation uh, over a dozen times, and not only because I think he's an engaging storyteller, I think the concepts and the way he explains things are so simply put. In his presentation, Dan Butner talks about three blue zones around the world, three communities, one in Japan, Sardinia, and California. And all these three communities boast a large number of healthy centenaries. So these are people that are living to be 100 plus, but healthy 100 year olds. The stories all come together at the end of his presentation where he reveals nine common diet and lifestyle habits that all connect these communities together. So if you can think about your science, does your science story have a similar, can you use a similar technique because you're bringing, weaving in different parts of your research, it could be a very powerful way to engage with your audience. <clears throat> Nested loops is another technique that is very similar to the petal structure. In this technique, what you do is you layer uh, three or more stories or narratives into a single story. If you use this technique, what you want to do is place your most important story or the core of your message at the center and then use the other stories to elaborate and explain that principle. So it's a great technique to, um, to explain how you were inspired, how you came to a conclusion, because it's usually not just around one story. It's a great technique to draw analogies, to explain what that central concept is, or how a piece of wisdom was passed along to you and how that might have inspired you to do something. John, uh, Joe gave you a presentation on how Airbnb designs for trust is a great example of nested loops. He shares his story of how the idea came to him and then the company's humble beginnings in San Francisco. So he talks about lots of things that he learned along the way, but the core of his message is really about how design principles helped Airbnb build a brand around trust. Remember, Airbnb did not exist. And his biggest concern was, how do I get strangers to advertise their most intimate spaces in their home and open it up to strangers, right? So he had to build a brand around trust. Sparklines is another storytelling technique. Graphic designer Nancy Dort uses sparklines to analyze famous speeches. And she argues that the best speeches succeed because they contrast our ordinary world with an ideal improved world. So really, what these, in these speeches, you hear a presenter comparing what is with what could be. Use a storytelling technique to draw attention to a problem that exists in society. And then you want to use both hope and reality, so highs and lows, to create and fuel a desire for change. Many politicians will use this highly emotional technique because it motivates an audience to support you. I think the best example of a speech that uses sparklines with the highs and lows is Martin Luther King's speech. In this iconic speech, he uses sparklines uh, to tell a very powerful and inspirational story. He does this by contrasting the racial intolerant society of the day with an ideal future where all races are treated equally. The mountain structure um, is the last storytelling technique that I want to show you. And it's a great technique to use if you want to introduce tension or drama in your story. It's very similar to the hero's uh, journey uh, or the monomyth, but what sets it apart is that the story does not necessarily have a happy ending. And while it is tempting for us to focus on stories that have happy endings, we know life isn't like that especially science, like it can take years, decades for us to find, you know, an answer to a problem. 
So you can use the mountain technique to inspire people by showing them how you dealt with challenges along the course of doing your research. You can also use this technique to build tension and to deliver a dramatic conclusion. Remember your conclusion doesn't have to be uh, you know, we found the we found a uh, you know a cure to cancer. It's really about your research and why it's meaningful by contributing, say, to the body of all the evidence out there. In two thousand and fourteen, General Motors CEO Mary Barra spoke to her employees and the media about an error that was caused by GM employees around an ignition switch recall. So instead of avoiding communication about this fatal error, she shared the details publicly and she encouraged her employees to keep the story in their memories as a warning. So we don't want this to happen again. It was a very inspirational uh, uh, presentation that she made. Okay, so I'm going to pause uh, for a few minutes and um, uh, you can again unmute your microphones uh, or type in your responses, but I want you to reflect on what you've heard so far and some of these storytelling techniques. Have you used any of these storytelling techniques and what has been your example? If you're comfortable sharing that, I think it would be wonderful for all of us to learn about that. Or the other question you can answer is, what storytelling techniques do you see yourself using? Maybe I'm gonna call on um, Chantelle Ritz. Um, I don't know if she's here. Let me take a look. I'm not sure she's on the call. Um, Hi, Selena, I'm right here. Oh, there you are, perfect. Okay, wonderful. The reason I wanted to, um, I wanted to go back, sorry, I'm just gonna go back here. Okay, uh, so Chantal, I wanted to ask you um, if you would be willing to share some of uh, your, your wisdom or the techniques that you used uh, today um, in your uh, TED style talk. So I jotted down a couple of things um, that you used. So I just wanna see if you had any reflections. What, do you, what techniques did you use what other techniques do you see yourself using in a similar type of presentation? Yeah, well, thank you for um, highlighting my talk. Um, I think, you know, really capturing people's attention early on, especially um, with your work that um, I think a few people mentioned, maybe your work might not be of high relevance to other people. Um, and, you know, it's really important to, to gain their attention, whether or not um, they're interested in your work like right away. So I think maybe I, I did that through, you know, the sentence that I had shown and how there was a part of it that was missing and it really caused people to like listen and focus in and, and try to um, figure out what was wrong with the sentence and then kind of hold on until I kind of revealed that. Um, so I think that kind of, I'm not sure what the one was, but the person dropping was maybe that the one that I used, but there's many different ones that you mentioned that I never thought of. Um, uh, especially like the pedal formation or the the one where you kind of have the different levels and then the what if and then back and forth that I think I would use in the future. But I think it's just really important to, especially when you only have three minutes or five minutes um, to really gain interest right off the bat. And so um, in other talks that I've done, like with my three minute thesis, I've, I've tried to do that right off the bat just to get people interested. And then I think it kind of makes the rest of the talk um, more interesting as you try and like develop the reason why you said that big impact statement at the start so thank you Chantal yeah that's uh, I, I agree with you I think some of the things um, that you talked about uh, you know just right in the beginning with the what's missing in this sentence right uh, the period um, e even the visuals that you used were quite um, helpful um, Kayla also uh, used a couple of techniques right where she said right up front uh, her story was about a, her, her presentation was a call to action 
but she also started her presentation framed as a story by using a case study. Um, so I, I think a lot of you this morning used some of these techniques, and I would just I would just advise you to think about some of these techniques. The next time you're doing a presentation, just challenge yourself and say, "Can I use one of these techniques?" Right? Um, anybody else who'd like to share some thoughts or, or, or ideas? Any questions or comments? Um, I had a, a comment. I really liked how you like laid everything out. Will your slide deck? be available to us at some point just so I can go back through all the different storytelling methods because I really like the petal one and then the nested one and just sort of having the like even the picture part of it so I remember all the names so I can go back through and then learn how to use them better would be lovely. A great question. Yes, I we uh, you know that the session is being recorded for one thing, yep. and yes, I will make my slides available. Megan will send this out to you, and then I've also created like a a, a one page worksheet that okay. summarizes everything that I will be talking about in today's presentation. So just stay yeah. Okay. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Any other questions, comments? Okay, I'm gonna take that as a cue to move on. There is a, a question, Selena. Thank you. Let me just pull this up here. Okay, ah, question by Diana. Is it possible to merge two techniques together or would that be confusing? This is, that's a great question. Um, I think intuitively when I think about the storytelling techniques, that I would use in my presentations, I tend to focus on one, mostly because it's always a, it's always a, it's a time crunch, right? So I only have 15 minutes or 20 minutes maximum to do a presentation, but I don't see why it's not possible to do this. So you could, for example, let's say, let's say you want to use the petal structure or the nested loops, right? Where you're building other stories around a central theme. You could use spark lines as a way to engage your audience by introducing kind of the highs and lows in that story. So I could, I could feasibly see that technique merging together. Even the hero's journey, right? The hero's journey doesn't always have to end with, you know, success or, you know, uh, like have a, have a happy ending. They, they do mostly, but, you know, you can always go back and build the hero's story to follow the mountain structure, right? Where you're building in more drama and perhaps all you can talk about at this point are the challenges in your research, right? Like how and how you're going to overcome them. You may not be able to share your results, but you can definitely talk about what those challenges are. And remember, by doing these things and by bringing in sort of these vulnerable elements into the way you solve a problem, your audience is going to connect with you, even if they, they don't want to. It's just a very human, it's a human connection right there. Like, you know, we all face challenges. And these are some creative ways that this researcher was able to overcome some of those obstacles and barriers. Great question. I'm gonna see if there are any other questions. Okay. So in addition to these, you know, uh, seven or eight techniques that I introduced you to, there are also other techniques that you can utilize the next time you're doing a presentation to make your science stories a lot more engaging. <clears throat> the first thing that you can do, and I think this is something we can all learn for and what we can do better at. You want to make scientific language both accessible and memorable, if preferably, if you could do both, that would be fantastic. So it's not just about avoiding scientific jargon. Yes, that can be a huge, uh, that could be a huge deterrent to your audience understanding what your science is about, but it's more than just making it accessible by, accessible by avoiding jargon. So this was a great um, example that I came across. So in a presentation, this person was talking about the, uh, a particular joint. It's called the avian carpal metacarpal joint. So in addition to being a mouthful, I'm not sure what they mean. I think I know what he's talking about, avian, maybe a bird, uh, carpal, carpal joint somewhere 
I don't know, your toes, your hands. Now, instead of saying that, the presenter actually said the pointy part of a KFC chicken wing. Like, how wonderful is that? I'm never going to forget the name of this joint. And I have a visual mem memory in my head about what exactly the speaker is talking about. So think about ways that you can make your scientific language accessible and memorable. The next time you start a presentation, instead of saying, here's what I do, try saying, here's how I got interested in what I do and why it's important. So you're basically saying, you know, you're telling us about the problem. How did it present itself, right? Or how did you arrive to some groundbreaking discovery or a practical solution? The other thing you could do, and again, this isn't something that I think I, I, I do very well, but I see lots, I see this at poster presentations when I'm at conferences, right? I'll walk into the conference hall, look at the posters, and most posters will have a title that conveys, that doesn't, a title that conveys the answer. It's not about what the problem is. So one way to hook your audience or a good way to engage with your with your audience is to have a title that will convey what the problem is as opposed to the answer. So an example that I came across in the kidney world where I'm working with one of the researchers is they're looking at the role of how MRIs can be used to detect sodium accumulation in, in human tissue. So that's a, that's a title, yes, it kind of tells you uh, what the uh, what the what the problem is, but the tell us. So the if you reframed it and you said how salt deposits under your skin contribute to chronic itch, you understand the importance of what the research is trying to answer. Does that make sense? Okay, the next thing um, that I, I want you to think about is that. When, you when you're talking about your science or you're presenting your science as a story, a good story moves forward when something is at risk, right? So there's some obstacle that the researcher has to overcome. In my story, the obstacle that I found working in this community in, in Kenya was that local authorities either failed to address the needs of marginalized communities. So these are people that live in slum communities or they continued to invest in solutions that were not helping the communities, right? So talk about like a, a, a waste of resources. So in my story, the obstacle that I had to overcome was to try and understand what other strategies are out there that could be used so that these marginalized communities can access primary health care. A good story needs an inciting incident. And by that, what I mean is something must happen that changes the current situation and presents a new opportunity, right? So most of our research is trying to do exactly that. We don't think of it that way, but what it does is it provides a hook that your audience is drawn to. So in my story, um, when I was doing research um, in a slum community in Nairobi, the inciting incident for me was how I had to problem solve around this issue of access to women living in the slum community, right? There are huge issues of safety and trust. Um, so I was able to work through a local church organization and not only were they able to provide me with safe passage into the slum community and a place to work safely, but it also provided a safe space for the women to be able to come to the church organization and to be able to be interviewed safely without having to be, without fearing that, you know, what their neighbors are going to think or what their partners are going to think. So that for me was the inciting incident. Good science communication is about finding elements already there in your research and then creating a story around it, right? So my advice to you would be to find what those key elements are. 
it's usually usually there are, there are lots of things we can talk about but you need to focus on a couple of those elements and then create an accurate and compelling story without introducing bias or fabrication you don't need to do that to make your story engaging so you're just going to learn how to frame a hook and draw on these universally recognizable elements of story structure. The other tip that I do have for you is, um, and this is something I have to also consciously do um, very often, it's the same thing. I listen to a great talk and I take notes. So why don't I do this in preparation for the work I do? So it's a great idea to develop a series of talking points that you can quickly refer to and have these handy in your back pocket. Um, I'm a visual learner, so I really like using like flowcharts or illustrations and templates. And this is a template that I came across, which uh, really allowed me to visualize the work that I do by being able to answer what I think are the key questions um, I want to get across to an audience, whoever that audience is. The first thing that I'm always reminded when I'm writing down my talking points is I need to be very clear and uh, I must be able to articulate these two things. What is the current situation and what needs, to, what needs to change? Then as I go up this sort of like tree or, or, or tower, there are five questions that you could speak to as a researcher, right? So maybe I only have three minutes in an elevator, in an elevator style presentation. And what I want to do is talk about who would benefit from my research or maybe all I want to talk about are resources, right? Like what did I need to be able to do field work? These are just, this is just one template that you can use. There's several out there. Another advantage of having these talking points handy is they form, they can form the basis for a 90 second elevator pitch. So here's a sketch that I did uh, a, a few years ago, and I remember thinking, okay, I want to try and get five things across to my audience. The first thing I wanted to do was start with a, a memorable statement or a sentence that summarizes the work I was doing, right? What am I changing and why is it important? And then I needed to get across what the problem was, so the opportunities for improvement. What is the solution and really who is it going to help? And then what makes my research different from other research, right? Like what is, the, what is unique about what I'm doing? Is it about my strategy? Is it about the communities I'm working in? And then finally, my call to action, what am I asking for? As with most forms of effective communication, I think it is really, really important that you know who your audience is and what message you wanna get across. So always, always ask yourself this, who is my audience and what do they already know about my topic? The other question you wanna ask yourself is, what is my message? What do I want them to know and for what purpose, right? I think these rules apply to any type of presentation that you're making. If you can answer those two questions, I think you might be really surprised to learn that what you want to say about your topic may be much less important than what your audience wants to hear about it. So I really like this um, cartoon because it does speak to this that very often we're just going to talk about what we think is important or what we're passionate about. And that might not be something that would resonate with your audience. I'm just gonna quickly pause here for a second and just see if there are any questions or in the chat. Feel free to unmute your microphone if anyone has any, any questions. Okay. I have a question here from uh, Danica. Is it ideal when presenting to non-science or non-medical community? What is it? Is this ideal? I feel as though if we were, if this was used with science-based people, they might not be okay with it. So that sorry. was that yeah. was relating to the chicken wing one. Oh yeah. I just because I was like, if your if your community is super science-based, then I feel like you could use the like the actual medical or Latin term, and it would be fine. Mm -hmm. And they probably they might think you were 
being silly or something if you know if, if it was the medical community I just feel like sometimes they're they're so strict and when you present or you have to use like the the correct jargon you're like encouraged to use it and if you don't it's seen as like you don't know what you're talking about but I understand when you're talking to other people like say you know like your group of friends or whatever you can use like it would be better to use the chicken you know like the pointy chicken wing part and then people would understand that and they would think it's funny but I just wasn't sure because I got the feeling like from what I've you know participated in it's not it wouldn't be like acceptable if it was around a bunch of people that were like heavily with uh, the science or medical background so that was my sort of like is it ideal to use it for them I just feel like it wouldn't be but I don't know and it's, it's a good point. And I think I think what it what, what this speaks to is having that understanding of your audience. If you are presenting a scientific paper or your research to a scientific community that's familiar with mm -hmm. you know the technical terms, by all means go ahead and use it. Nowadays it's just, you know, I go to conferences right now and like the Canadian Society of Nephrology Conference, they've opened it up to policymakers, decision makers. Um, patients right oh, so okay. when I think Got about my audience and I'm like yeah. okay I can use a scientific terminology and there are different techniques that you can use right like they yeah. always try and avoid acronyms yeah uh, especially if you use too many of them or explain things in the beginning and then and then you can refer to it so again it's just having that understanding of who your audience is okay. which I think is helpful but you 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 do raise a good point okay um I'm going to move on then so this slide kind of goes back to trying to understand your audience, right? And how much that they know already about your topic. So if you know who your audience is and how much they already know about your topic, you can then choose the parts of your research story to focus on, right? So if your audience is already familiar with the background and how the topic, yeah, like why is this topic important, you don't need to spend as much time building that into your story, right? Understanding where your audience is allows you to see the journey through their eyes. So it's another great way of thinking about how to frame your science story. Once you understand where your audience is, then you can leverage these different storytelling techniques that we've learned about today. Um, the last thing that I wanna to talk to you about is the use of images as a hook to support your story. Now, many of us uh, are doing presentations where we're using slides and we're using imagery. And uh, today in some of the TED Talks, there was great use of imagery to support the presentation so they didn't have a ton of slides to use or a ton of images but the great thing about using an image if you if you are going to use an image to support your science story is it can provide a hook to support your story and a hook really allows you to frame your story and send out a very clear message it's usually crafted for a very specific audience in mind so I really like these two um, ads uh, because they really speak to how you can use images to speak to a specific audience. So in 2007 or 2008, mumps re-emerged in Canada. Um, and it was prevalent amongst post-secondary students who had only received one dose of the vaccine. So what Alberta Health Services did is that they initiated a vaccination program uh, to provide a second dose of the vaccine to students. And the way they did this is to use two sex specific ads and they call these ads the Jack ads and the Jill ads, right? Like the Jack and Jill ads. So if you look at the first ad on the left, this is called the Jack ad. And in this ad, what you see is a pair of burning basketballs with uh, the slogan, the swelling is not so bad, it's the severe testicular pain. The Jill ad is a contrasted ad, and it depicts a young woman with the slogan, Jill got mumps, um, uh, Jill got the mumps, she then partied with her friends, poor Jill, now her friends hate her. So what's really interesting about the use of images um, in these ads is that none of these um, ads really focus on mumps as an illness. The ads focus on social fears. 
overtly implying that if you have the mumps, you cannot party, you cannot play sports, you can't go to school or go to class. And if you do spread the mumps, you're going to be socially ostracized. So I think there are many benefits of learning this new skill, right? Like how to turn your science story into an effective presentation so you can have more engagement with your audience. The first thing I think it does is it forces you to really, really think about your audience. And in the process of doing that, you become a better teacher. It can help with grant proposals. Now, I've heard that reviewers have to sort through so many competing projects. So if you, so your proposal could be far more appealing if you can command the interest of the group and communicate the importance of your work in an accessible way. As funding for research decreases, you may also need to reach other sources to attract funding, such as private donors, for example. Private donors are highly intelligent people, but they may not be familiar with your research or even understand it. So you need a narrative that could reach them. Your work will be a lot more interesting if they can understand what it is that you're trying to do. So here are my five take home messages for you. And this will help you perfect your science story. The first thing I'd like you to think about is how you can identify your most compelling messages based on who you're talking to and what you hope to achieve. The second thing is you want to try as much as possible to cut out any irrelevant background processes or methods that don't move your story forward in a compelling way. Remember, if you know how much your audience already knows, you can spend less time talking about it and focus on the more interesting parts of your story. The third thing is to use vivid language. And again, this isn't something that comes to most of us naturally. So it's something we're gonna to have to practice. But what you want to do is weave an emotional thread, help your audience feel like he or she is there with you. Try as much as possible to get feedback, right? And by that, I mean, you're gonna write your story once, twice, you might write it like 10 times before you get it down to something you're happy with. Try and reflect with every draft or every time you do a presentation, what could I have done better? Maybe um, ask if you're presenting at a conference, ask the conference uh, organizers, could I see the evaluations if they haven't sent it to you, right? Use that, reflect, try again. Um, try and find somebody you trust to give you constructive and supportive criticism. And finally, embrace the discomfort and the transformation, right? Like we've all been taught to speak the scientific language in a particular way using a particular formula and not to say that hasn't worked but you know I think I think we're now at a point where we have so much technology and we have so many techniques that we can utilize to help us engage with our audience in a much more meaningful way and really more importantly to be able to make our science and our research accessible to a much broader audience. I remember practice makes perfect. So in conclusion, if you want to become a better communicator, if you want to engage with your audience in a much more meaningful way, and you want to make your research more memorable, then you might want to try using a storytelling technique the next time you have a presentation. Have an open mind, start slowly, take a few chances, and remember to have some fun, right? We, it, it's a great skill that will take you really far in life. Um, I'm just going to show you the worksheet that uh, Megan will be sending to you at the um, after this presentation. Um, it basically summarizes all the techniques that we talked about. So you could use this worksheet the next time you're trying to put your thoughts or your notes together for a presentation and see if you can incorporate even a few of the techniques. Okay, um, I will, that brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, we've, got, we've got 20 minutes for questions and answers. Um, and what I would love to hear from you, just so that we can close the loop, um, is really what do you think 
is the most valuable thing that you learned today? Or what do you think you are going to do differently after today's presentation? I think it's, it's really helpful for me uh, to see what parts resonated with you, but it also helps you reflect on how you're going to take the information and use it in your own, in your own life. Thank you. I think I'll stop sharing so we can see all your faces. There we go. Okay, Lauren's going to use spark lines. <laughs> Chantelle has a great question. She's, she asks, um, how many different ways um, are they to tell a story rather than using the same? Okay, oh, sorry, that's how you, that's how, that's what you, your takeaway from today's presentation, that there are other ways to tell a story rather than using the same one over and over again. Great. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Thank you so much. Perfect. How about somebody who's got who's who's making a presentation uh, that's very science heavy, right? So it's a it's like, let's say it's uh, it's it's a scientific style presentation, right? Do you think you would be able to utilize some of the techniques that you've learned about today? I'd say yes, definitely. Uh, it'd be useful just to, it's just maybe not even changing the language, but just like how you tell the story, like using, sorry, I always bring the pedal one back. It's just because I liked it. Um, but just like, you can still use all your scientific terms. You can still be very science focused, but you can still tell it in a story and you can keep coming back to sort of, I guess, the one issue that you experienced. And then, you know, you can like weave it in. So you can, I, I think, I feel like you can adjust the mm -hmm. models that you just gave us to various situations and it might not be the language that we adjust but it's how we use the language and how we formulate what we did what we were looking for and what we found into sort of you know using the methods that you showed us so i think yeah definitely you can use these mm -hmm. thanks thank you danica okay uh here's a comment from Jenna, I'm working on a research study working with um, indigenous populations and knowledge translation is something that is imperative for language translation. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, again, this, it's, you're really mindful about your audience and especially with when you're doing work in indigenous community. So when you think of the concept of knowledge translation, we think of knowledge like the actual word and what what qualifies as knowledge in a very Western scientific way, right? Whereas in indigenous communities, sources of knowledge can come from elders, from knowledge keepers, through storytelling, through ceremony, right? So it's really, really important if you are going to be speaking to your audience um, about um, research that you're doing in, in, in indigenous communities is to weave in some of those elements, right? Can help your audience also connect with that population. 